from like I'm not talking about like a dance banger that was on like Top of the Pops. I'm talking about the clubs in the '90s type thing. It's got mm. like it's got like the vocal sampling and the tone and the slightly like and the kind of it's got the verve really. Um, and she sent the demo over and I was just immediately bl- like blown away. Like, yeah, I'd love to work on this. Um, and she said to me, can we include mixing as a part of this? Because I've heard some of your mixes and I really like your width. And I was like, yep, that's fine. So she's hired me to do ad production and mixing. And that is the particular job, the role I'm performing. In comparison, another artist I'm working with is Ruby Tingle, who's on No Such Thing Records. And Ruby actually uh, co-founded the label with Danny, um, who's a creative partner of hers who does her mixing on her solo stuff. But those two together form a band called Dirty Freud, who I'm also doing work with right now. And uh, Danny and I were doing a session. We were just sat here making things, making noise. And uh, we were playing each other a few bits and bobs. And I said, hey, I've got this instrumental that I've cooked up with a friend of mine from when I was doing my ICMP study I'd love I, I don't know and at first I said I think I'm looking for a rapper to do something with this like some kind of a flow over the top of it um, because it has very much like how would I describe it it's like Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence theme but with The weekend. <laughs> I know the weekend, but uh, okay. I don't know Merry Christmas. You, but you, I'm not you, sure if it's because I'm Jewish or if it's or because no, I'm not from England. But it's either actually way. <laughs> this is this is like a cultural thing. People don't think they know that piece of music, but they do. I promise you. If you Google Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, um, the movie, and then put soundtrack in it and look for the main theme, you will recognize it. Um, okay. In I the same way that it. everyone knows like the 2001 Space Odyssey theme, but they don't always know where it's from. So yeah, so it's got those kinds of vibes and I I showed it to Danny and Danny was like, I think I know someone who'd like this. And he sent it to Ruby and Ruby said, I want to write on top of this. Great. So she she did, she did this phenomenal Kate Bush-esque top line and I was just, my mind was blown and I said, this is great. And And then she said, okay, can you send to Danny to mix I said okay so I bounced out all my stems and now Danny's got them and he's mixing them and that's that's fine and I was like yeah cool cool man <laughs> you're cool you're cool either way yeah because ultimately it's awesome. got it's got to be about what the artist wants and you know I think it's one of these things where people could say well you know you're losing income not if they give me a great recommendation like if they recommend me to somebody and I wasn't kicking up a stink because I wanted to mix for them, then I've gained new clients. So there's no like there's no custom there's no downside to good customer service. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless unless like mixing is exactly what you want to be doing, mm. then there's no point. Mm. But you know, it's like it's like I, I find with like specializing and stuff, it's like it's just great to bring other people in because it kind of loosens up bottlenecks. Like I yes. find like the transition from you know, production to mixing can be a bottleneck and from mixing mm. to mastering could be a bottleneck and mm. from like recording to editing could be a bottleneck. Like all these things, if you could dole something out to someone else, then it gives you a chance to move on to the next project and it gives you more time. Yeah, for sure. And we've all had those projects where that have just sat on our hard drive for a long time. Yes. You yes, know, and totally. we don't want that. We never want that. We always just to have it all tied up with a nice bow and pushed out the door and then they, we can move on Ship to the it. next one. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. So uh, we've kind of talked about your production approach and your mixing approach. You want to put us into the world of your remixing approach? Sure. Yes. And then maybe we could, that could be like a good, uh, you know, impetus into the into the sauce segment. Segway. <laughs> I like it. Segway. That's Segway. the word. Yeah. Um, yes. So remixing has a lot of similarities, but in many ways is a lot faster because... I am making something that's sort of, that's my interpretation of something. And there's a lot less pressure attached because everyone understands that that's what's happening. Um, so le- so I tend to be a little bit more instinctive with remixes. Um, usually I've like, we have a pre-negotiated arrangement before in terms of like how much is going to be paid and whether there's going to be splits and things like that. Then I take the stems and I and this is the similar this is the how it's similar and then I pick the ones I like and I sometimes I purposefully don't listen to the original track first because I'm not interested in emulating that track I'm interested in interpreting that track so 
sometimes it's more fun to just listen to the stems one by one and then be like, right, no, that's boring. That sounds like it's been played slightly off time. I'm not sure they quantize that because sometimes things land in the mix and they haven't been quantized properly because they sound correct in the mix. And, you know, or that's freaking cool. That's also freaking cool. And I just go through all of them. I set aside like a couple of hours just to like blitz my way through all of them. And then I take particularly the lead vocal line and I listen to it isolated and I pick the sections that either lyrically speak to me or you know in terms of the quality of the vocal performance speaks to me or both if we're lucky Um, and then I start to Frankenstein things together like I'm like okay I'm gonna take this section of this bit that I really like and I'm gonna cut it into blocks and I literally build it like blocks into sections start labeling them at the top and then I start to play with structure um so for example uh there's a band that's very popular in the UK that's called Foles they do a remix competition and I took I took a bunch of stems from that because I wanted to practice um uh without pressure and what was really interesting was I could hear in the guitars a progression that wasn't in the original track and I was familiar with the original track when I started so it's a track called Wash Off and I was I could hear it was just like like a a minor progression with two notes with like one transitional note in between and so I pulled like I think I just pulled like a really dramatic synth from Alchemy um, that was like a really dark grainy pad and then I just like put this progression in and put the guitar over the top and it sounded sick so then I was like right okay this is going to be the this is going to act as the base it's going to be the core and I'm going to I basically just abandoned all of the drum kit I think I kept one sample of the kick um and just got into digital drums started being like okay let's put this here and then I sent actually I took it to one of our listening parties at two percent rising which is something I I do when it's like a low stakes project um when someone's not going to kick off at me for sharing it in the wrong space and (laughs) and which might happen and Katie pointed out, or you, she said, you have a habit of leaning into a particular structure where your remixes are concerned. I'm going to challenge you to flip it and reverse it. Flip it and reverse it. Um, nice Missy Elliott reference there. And then, and I did, and I put the, I basically flipped the build. So it started really big and I created like a weird intro that was really disruptive and then like like a full force of like this section and then had it kind of like, kind of almost tiptoe its way down into something that I could then take a Glock sample from the original set of stems and make that the sparkly next instrument that then kind of like wove its way back into building the layers up. So a lot of it is play. Like you you play with the with an experiment with the sounds until it feels yeah. like it's going on a journey and then you just run with it. Just keep, just keep running, keep running. Yeah, dope. That's that's a great, that's a great. Uh, you really laid it out for us, like your your mindset and how, what you're thinking about. And <laughs> yeah, I yeah, think that's awesome. I need to experiment more with remixing. I've done a couple. Uh, it's not something I've done a ton of, but uh, it's always cool to kind of re envision a song and see where it could go in a completely different direction. And yeah, it's really, so, it's really fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's yeah. like uh, I, I interviewed a guy named Enoch uh, Yang, uh, who he is. He he's not a full time producer because he ha- he works uh, he works for a um uh what, like a licensing company mm. um and he but but when he's working he's like you know marketed himself as a you know a remix producer mm. and it's like a very it's a cool niche because he's able to kind of no first of all nobody else is doing it but it's it's like everybody's happy to send off something for remixing so it's like a really easy you know market to kind of get into because mm. it's like great you're gonna remix it cool like and none of the you know emotional back and forth of you know when you're working with an artist as their baby and it's like it's like everything is like kind of like you said it's like easy mm. it's fun everyone's happy for it to be to turn into something new you mm. know and uh so he he loves that space and yeah it was cool it was that's cool awesome what was his name again enoch 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 yang, yang. enoch yang okay 
Nice. I'll, it's a. Uh, I can find it for you. Oh, yes. Episode yeah, one hundred and something. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that would yeah. be sick. <laughs> I'll Amazing. You, I'll, I'll say it'll be in the show notes, guys. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone listening. Awesome. So, so let's take a let's take a a, a um, let's take a shift over to the uh, sauce segment. Mm. You sent me a track called Narc by Shar, and it's the Rooks remix. Yes. So let's have a listen to your approach to. Definitely, people can hear your approach to drums and remixing, um, in this sauce segment. So I'm just gonna pull it up and we'll listen in real time. Sound cool? Sure, go for it. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Uh, it it, it uh, reminds me, you were talking about like 90s club. Like that's totally the vibe. I think it's slowly creeping into a lot of things I do actually, to be honest, because I think that's the problem. Sometimes you have to be careful if you're developing like a, multiple projects at the same time, which I have been for a, a number of weeks now. Um, you, yeah. They creep into each other and you have to be like, no, mm-hmm. it's a different artist. Give them different things. Otherwise, everything yeah. just it, it sounds homogenous, you know, and I don't think my artists would be very impressed with that because they all want to be individuals. So, um, yeah, but it is. It's it's definitely got some 90s vibes in there. Like, it was really fun finding, like, drum loops to chop, which is what I ended up doing. Mm. And I don't always do that super often because I like to generate my own samples a lot of the time. But I just thought I I was like, oh, yeah, I haven't used drum loops in a while. It's been a minute. Let's let's try that. And I ended up using two in the end um, that were just stock drum loops and um, and then augmenting them with uh, some of other stems that um, Shah had sent over um, and some of my own program beats. So, yeah, it was it was sick. Yeah. I mean, like what what's what's going on in terms of like the bass, uh, anything else? Uh, there are some cool air candies on the side. Mm-hmm. Like to walk us through it a little bit. So I was very blessed with Shah's remix because Shah actually sent a bunch of stems that I loved. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes I will get like 30 to 40 stems and only five five that I like. And that means that I have to do more work. So um, mm-hmm. so I'm always really delighted when there's a variety. Um, and Shah sent quite a confectionery of ear candy that kind of pops up in very often very subtly in the original track so um right. but i one of the nice things about remixes is you get to emphasize the parts of the track that they're almost like hidden gems like you you sort of hear them almost like referred to in the song but no right. they don't get to necessarily shine as things they that are. kind of become part of the the bed yes can be like individually taken out and emphasized yes yes exactly know. and given their own space both in the stereo field or in the arrangement so um so yeah so that's that's one of the things that i really loved i think what's what was terrific was that the bass the bass itself was something that i had to rebuild because something interesting happened with shah's recording and shah i know you'll be listening so forgive me for saying this we can chat about it later if i'm in trouble um (laughs) but something that i realized was it took me a long time to figure out the bpm and that's because it's actually it sits on a half it's one to eight point five bpm which is awkward in many ways from a quantization perspective so i was basically aware that 
she had these beautiful ideas that were embedded in the track but some of them weren't sitting right on the grid so I recreated them and in this case I recreated um, the 